first of all, your passion chooses you. You don't choose your passion. It's, it's really not easy just to get born and know, okay, this is my call in life, you know. It somehow, based on experiences, there is something that was implanted in your heart. Somehow, we, we, we know that we like something, we don't know the reason, okay. But following that passion and started watering, you know, those plants or those seeds could lead you to figure out a bigger life purpose. But for me, passion is the gas of your car. If you don't have enough gas for a long journey, you'll stop somewhere in the middle. The Tom Screen podcast is owned and made possible by Ethical Marketing Service. If your business is struggling with Google or Facebook ads, maybe you're frustrated figuring it out or there's a performance issue, Ethical Marketing Service has worked on hundreds of accounts and we can help in this area. We offer a 30 day money back guarantee. If you would like to find out if we can help, it's a free, no salesy consultation call and the link is in the description. Enjoy the episode. Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the episode today, we have Mustafa Amar. Mustafa, welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Pleasure being with you today. <laughs> it is also my pleasure. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, sure. So I'm Mustafa Amar. I'm um, by origin, I'm Egyptian. Um, and in the incarnation uh, vocabulary, I lived a few career lives in the past. So I started my first career as a pharmacist out of passion for chemistry. Uh, I moved then to diplomacy out of passion to, you know, travel the world, represent my culture in a in a better way. Um, after 10 years of diplomacy, I thought I reached the peak in my career and I thought of changing again. Um, and I moved to investment banking. Uh, I was in China at that time, so I moved to a multinational investment bank uh, in China. Uh, I worked there for four years. Um, somehow I was doing my MBA at the same time in, in the UK, in Manchester, and somehow I thought of trying something else. And uh, I moved to entrepreneurship. Um, I become a career coach. So the last three and a half years, I've been you know coaching dozens to hundreds of people how to change their careers. I, I have seen that need and that issue <laughs> a lot. Um, right now, I'm starting on my fifth life, so trying to scale that service into a tech startup, uh, a platform that would help as many people. You're a busy man, basically. Yeah, trying trying to have an impact on, on, on different fronts. This is actually uh, a worth living life, I would say. <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, I feel like going through your story and everything would be a would be a very interesting thing to cover. But I also think that the topic that you cover, your expertise, is actually really valuable for people because I think you touched on it um, that there are a lot of people in their jobs or careers who don't feel. I think the statistics are something like I'm, I'm fudging the statistics a bit, but it's something like twenty percent of people actively dislike um, or harm their role in some way. And a further something along the lines of 30% are no longer engaged, don't like it anymore. So why would you yeah. say that is? And uh, what should they do? Well, if we are deeper into some other numbers as well, in, in 2019, there were a massive study uh, done by Gallup, and it showed 85% of full-time employees around the world behave their jobs. Um, in the US, we're around 70%. So when I was looking at those numbers, you know, it, it's it's really a red alert. It's, it's, you have almost 2.3 billion people. You don't like the jobs. You know? So there, there was something. And I've been through this in, in several, you know, phases in my life. I, and I started digging deeper into this, why this is happening. Uh, and, and the answer is not uh, one line. It, the answer is a bit complicated. It, it goes back to many things, including uh, you need to be passionate about what you're doing. Uh, and secondly, we change. So um, uh, in our human nature, uh, we change. So me and you, Thomas, 10 years ago, five years ago, we're different, different people, different persons and personalities. Uh, 10 years from now will also change. So the evolution, the evolution in your personality, your interests, your passions, is something that we don't have and put into account when you just have to decide you stick to one job or career all your life, right? Another uh, side of this is that 
also our nature get bored. We get bored quickly. You know, if you keep doing the same job for, I don't know, five, 10 years, I mean, you probably any, any type of job that you do more than five years, you, you get an expert, you know, uh, you have that expertise level in it. And then after that, it's a very repetitive uh, kind of task. So you need to look at, okay, what's next? Um, and if I just go back a bit to, you know, when I was five, six years old, my, my parents' relative used to ask me that question, you know, what you want to be when you grow up? The uh, natural answer for me was, I, I used to say five, six things. You know, I want to be a football player, an astronaut, an engineer, you know, many things. And uh, you know, their reply, their response was always sad for me. It's like, no, you have to stick to one. You cannot be all this. <laughs> um, it was sad. It was sad, but I had to confirm at some point because the, you kept asking the same question. I kept answering the same answer, and always I get the same response. So somehow I had to make be no better than me. Uh, I had to confirm. Uh, so I was in that struggle uh, since I was six years old until I think 16, 17, when you have to decide. You know, it's like okay, what should I pick? Uh, is it football? Is it you know engineering? Is it uh, being a doctor or a diplomat? Or whatever. Um, it was hard. Somehow, when I was sixteen, I I thought to make it easy for me is just to pick the subject that I enjoy more in school. That's it. No need to think. You know, ten, fifteen years from now, just think of what you're enjoying right now. And I found that in chemistry. So I, uh, I look at, okay, math, chemistry, whatever. And then, okay, chemistry, I'm enjoying it. I love it. Uh, um, I think I want to study it for, you know, I don't know, five more years or so. Um, and that informed my decision. I say, well, okay, maybe I don't like pharmacy. Maybe pharmacy is not for me. But maybe pharmacy has all types of chemistry that I would just enjoy uh, studying. And uh, somehow that was the... the the short-term answer for me, at least, you know, medium-term answer. I, I went to pharmacy. Uh, somehow I enjoyed, you know, studying all types of chemistry. It was uh, interesting. And at some point it was painful because, oh, I think it's enough. <laughs> I think, you know, I enjoy chemistry, but there is a limit. Um, by the end of my last semester, I figured out that pharmacy is not for me. I enjoyed so much doing this. I thought if if I had some, I don't know, zone of genius in something, I think it was in, in pharmacy, in chemistry, I mean. And uh, I think it's enough. Maybe it helped me, maybe it didn't help me, but it's enough. Uh, and this is how I started my journey of just transitioning, trying to find another passion. Uh, it was a painful journey, but of course, we can dive deeper into that. Well, uh, thank you for the answer. I think it's a great one. Um, it does make me think of the, you, you mentioned all the logical reasons why people need to change their careers, which um, I'd like to delve in uh, deeper to, but it does make me yeah. think of the flip side. So have you noticed any characteristics of people who stay in the same job 20, 30 years? What is, yeah. what is it that enables them to do that? Yeah. I would, I would go to, because I, I recently published a book, it's, it's called Time to Move On. And that's, that's actually the answer to, to this your question right now. Because I learned the hard way to bust some of the myths I used to believe in all my life. And uh, somehow I saw all these myths are what is, you know, locking people in, in you know, their stateless, you know, uh, position, whatever they are, and not, not able to advance. So I will just mention a few of them. Um, the first one I, I touched on e e earlier, it's called the supreme specialist myth. So uh, people mostly will believe that the only way to succeed in your career, in your life, is to stick to one specialization, go on that specialization, get you know the expert level there, don't ever leave it. And uh, this is you know a prescription for success in your life and your career. Um, the more people believe in this, the more they're not able to escape right their expertise um, um so i'm proving i'm actually disproving this and i'm proving that there is other way to succeed and i call it being a career shapeshifter uh, and let's let's imagine you know um koala as a specialist animal 
uh, it lives in a specific type of environment. It eats only eucalyptus leaves. Uh, when change hits, when you know environment degrees goes up or you know lower a bit, it hits koala. Koala is not able to survive in such circumstances. It's not able even to even such other uh, types of foods. On the other side, raccoon is a generalist animal, or I like to call him shapeshifter. And a shapeshifter, in in this case, raccoon is able to live wherever you put him. Yeah, wherever, like uh, whether it's uh, it's very high temperature, uh, very low, very cold in, in North Europe, in the US, wherever. Uh, it eats everything. It eats anything. So when change hits, it survives. Yeah. So going back to you know our career, if a specialist who is a specialized in one tiny specialization, and now with technological advancement, AI. Millions of jobs are in the danger of going extinct. Uh, what a specialist will do in that case? You know, if you are a coder or a software engineer and uh, your job will disappear you know, three to five years from now, what would you do? Uh, the answer is in career shift shifting. So that's one, for example, myth. I dive deeper into other myths, though, a bit psychological, because people think it's too late for me to change. You know, I'm, I'm in my 40s, 50s, and, you know, and 60s, and uh, no, I could change now. You know, I, I wish if I could do that earlier. And I'm disproving, whether through research, data, also stories, that it's never too late. And I'm just showing stories of people who change in their late 60s, their 70s, and they were able actually to change their life. Um, and I dive deeper into the mindset and, and the journey of change. Yeah, because, because also another myth is change is risky. No way. No, I cannot change. Um, so I'm, I'm showing you the journey of change. Like when you start your comfort zone, how it looks like. And then when you start going out, um, the next zone, how does it look? And then the third zone, when you start growing and you see a bit of result. Um, so also showing you the journey will, will show you where you're going to suffer, what are the pains. And what are the gains? Uh, so also disproving that. Uh, so in many different ways. Uh, another one is leaving my job is a sunk cost. Leaving my career is a sunk cost. And a sunk cost is I invested a lot of money, energy, effort in something. And now I'm going to leave all of that and start somewhere else, you know, from scratch. And I'm proving that you can transfer every single skill with you, wherever you go. Wherever you go, um, you're moving with your expertise, you're moving with your mindset, with, with everything. And I'm showing that through stories, through, you know, many different things. Uh, I'll just give you a quick example in my life. I studied chemistry and um, it was my, my main specialization. When I moved to diplomacy, I thought, this is it for me. No, I'm, I'm not going to benefit from that anymore. And I started questioning, why would I study chemistry if I wanted to be a diplomat, if I want to do something else? Uh, somehow, I think seven, eight years down the road, I moved to China and I had to learn Chinese. So I spent one full time study uh, to, to learn the language before I start my journey there. Uh, and then, to my surprise, reading and writing Chinese characters was so easy for me. I don't know why, but that helped me to focus my energy on speaking the language because speaking in, in tones, it was very different from any language we know. Uh, but reading and writing was super easy. Um, somehow a few years later, when I understood the concept of analogical thinking, uh, where when you have an analogy in the past and expertise or a skill, and then you have a new situation and you know, a new deal that you're dealing with, and then you're bringing that previous expertise skill. It helps you to learn that one quickly or tackle that task quickly. And just to give you the, the similarity between both chemistry and, and Chinese, when you draw a, a compound in organic chemistry, there is always a logic. And the logic goes like this. You draw any compound, you go from left to right, from up to down. Always there are endings in every compound, and they mean something. They mean an effect, an impact, whatever. Uh, the same applies to Chinese. You go from left to right, from up to down, 
always the ending has a meaning, whether it's in pronunciation or in, in the tone itself or whatever. Uh, so doing that unintentionally and having that experience helped me to do another skill and learn another skill very quickly. And it applies to everything you could do. It's a great answer. Um, I wanted to follow up on one thing, which was um, the... You mentioned that, that it, it can be painless moving from one job to another uh, because people perceive it to be risky. Um, yes. There, there is obviously a, a wrong way to go about doing this and it's something that I've done, which is I've had enough of this job. I'm leaving. I'll figure it out. I'll figure out the next steps, whatever they are when I get to them. And um, yes. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but what are your thoughts on the unsafe uh, in quotations, yes. and the safe yes. way to go about doing it. Yeah, I would also recommend just waiting until the moment where you're burnout and you're, you're <laughs> enough of this. And there, there is a way. There are signs that uh, each one of us should see. You know, like, for example, I'm not productive enough, um, not happy enough with the environment. Uh, or let's say um, my personal values are not in line anymore with my organization value or with that specific job or, or career. There are many signs, uh, many symptoms you can see in yourself. Okay, Waking up every morning, like there is in, in the same type of job, I remember uh, sometime I was waking up so excited about what I would do the next morning and uh, just go full of energy, you know, and um, I would work 12 hours, 13, 14 hours, and I don't mind. And then in that same type of job, a few years later, when just a phone call from somebody in my team or from an ex-boss or so, how I am irritated, you know, just to pick up that phone. So it's it's a it's a sign that um, you really have to leave, or you, at least you need to get deeper to know why, why this is happening. Um, there are, of course, many reasons behind this, but once you know that, okay, you really need to 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 start planning for the next step. Uh, but the best way is to have a transitional plan, and transitional plan, you know, optimum six months. Uh, you need to plan what we need to do in those six months, and and I found when even myself or with other you know client that I'm working with, when we have this transitional plan, it helps them to work better in an environment they don't like even because they know they're leaving anyway and because the feeling of being stuck somehow is irritating you know i'm stuck i don't know what to do but when you know there is you know there is a hope somewhere there okay fine you know guys i'm with you for six months uh, and i have my own exit plan and very soon we're gonna know about this um so it's it's good for your mood it's good for building a clear vision and what you really need to do and also it's good for being productive because it's it's not a good feeling working in a place where you you know you don't satisfy the idea of working hard or being productive or so or so. Um, back to the the plan itself. Any plan doesn't work unless you have a clear vision of what's the next step. At least right after the six month. Okay, I don't know what will happen ten years from now, but at least after the six month, um, we can dive deeper into this, but. It, there is a methodology that I, I instilled from my experiences and I apply on my clients and it dives deeper into yourself. So you get to know a bit about your passions, a bit about your values, having an, a, a quick idea on what entails to be, uh, to have an ideal lifestyle, you know, where you want to live or what you want to do, all of these things. And then a bit of skill analytics, merge all of this together and then somehow you find, okay, I think the next step would be this. Okay, that's uh, fair enough for six months or one year. Thank you for the answer. And um, you actually alluded to something which I was going to ask you about. And that is um, when you were younger and you chose chemistry, it was sort of like the, what do I enjoy the most? What's my uh, what's yeah. my passion, if you will? And that is a phrase that you hear, you know, follow your passion. Uh, is there anything, what would you say the misconceptions are about that, if any? There are lots. There are a lot of misconceptions. There are a lot of conflicting messages all around. Uh, I see gurus and experts advise people not to follow their passions. Uh, um, I consider myself somebody who spent a lot of time on passion, understanding my passion. 
I clean, I get to know them in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so I would argue, I would, I would just share a few things about passion. So first of all, your passion chooses you. You don't choose your passion. Um, it's, it's really not easy just to get born and know, okay, this is my call in life. You know, it somehow based on experiences, there is something that was implanted in your heart and that will bring you to another, um, definition of passion, right? I call it passions are the seeds that God implants in your heart to figure out your life purpose. Somehow we, we, we know that we like something. We don't know the reason. Okay. But following that passion and started watering, you know, those plants or those seeds could lead you to figure out a bigger life purpose or, or, you know, or knowing a meaning in your life or having a, a meaningful career or also not every passion would lead to uh, a career uh but for me passion is the gas of your car if you don't have enough gas for a long journey you'll stop somewhere in the middle um so somehow you really need to figure out you know your your passions carefully another rule of passion um our passion shift or change so somehow um I used to have passions for things now I'm really not enjoying anymore. I could still, you know, do them uh, as a hobby or so, not anymore as an integral part of my life. And then also, when you learn new things in life, you start having new passions. And those new passions could lead you to new things in life. So also our passion change or shift. Another um rule of passion is sometimes you have passion for something you don't understand whether it's a city or something is like well i don't know why you know but also how, how to say keeping that passion close to your heart might lead to a destiny somehow because again it's it's for whatever reason mysterious reasons or not you have that love for that i will just give an example i love new york Okay, and I, I lived in New York several times, and I keep going back and forth to New York for many reasons. I work in the UN, 2010, and there are other things that are happening. So you never know what's the next destiny, you know? because of that love, if you keep that love or that passion close to your heart and keep getting it close, that might lead you to a destiny somewhere down the road. A great answer. There's a couple of things in there, which um, you've mentioned a couple of times about how people change and therefore your career is, yeah. should we say, probable that it's going to change, uh, which I haven't, I haven't actually heard people say that, you know, it's logical for people to want to do different things because, because they are now different people. I thought that was worth highlighting. And also um, the, the metaphor of the gas in your car, and you're only going to get so far if you haven't got that passion. I just thought that was very... Yeah. Very poignant, a good point. Um, I want to just uh, talk a little bit about the book, uh, Time to Move On. Why did you write it? Um, originally, I was writing another book. Um, so I'm, I was writing the passion projects and uh, the idea of if, if you consider your life or your career as a project, which I think it's the case, you really need to build your life and your career on the right foundations. Majority of us build them on, I would say, the wrong foundations, which means uh, I'm just in this job or this career because it pays well, because my parents asked me to do so, because whatever, because uh, the environment, because the society um, values, you know, being a doctor or whatever. Um, so that's, I would say, a wrong foundation for my life. A weak foundation is something else. Uh, and if you have the wrong foundation, you will spend most of your life trying to fix the problems that would come out of that. Weak foundations means at some point, the whole, the whole building will collapse. The whole project will collapse. So how to have the right foundations, that was the, the, the key. So I'm um, again talking about the analogy of having enough gas in your car. Um, I could extend a bit on that because it's also interesting. It's not only about gas. It's like, let's imagine we are driving a car together for thousands of miles or kilometers. Um, 
So maybe it will take us a few days to, to get to our destination. I assume we need three essential elements, enough gas, which we talked about earlier, a GPS, and a final address. Uh, without enough gas, we'll stop in the middle, right? Without a GPS, we'll get lost, I don't know, dozens or hundreds of times in the middle. Maybe we'll never get to our destination. And also, there is no benefit of having a GPS. If you don't have a final address to reach, you know, to just to write down in, in your GPS tracker. So let's apply this again on our life, our career. Enough passion, uh, enough gas means enough passion. If you don't have enough passion for whatever you're doing, you're stopped somewhere in the middle, don't know why this is happening, why you're burned out, why whatever, you know, other reasons. Um, as GPS is your values. I've seen a lot of people working in careers that don't satisfy their values. So it's very important that your personal values, first of all, are measured, are metered, are tracked. You know your at least your core five values and then stick to them. Because your values are part of your identity, right? It, it's your GPS. Uh, so if you don't have a career or job or life that doesn't satisfy your values, you will get lost the same way you don't have a GPS in the middle, right? And a final destination will make it very easy for you to get your destination. If I don't have a destination, even if that change along the way, let's say, let's say we are after two, three days of traveling, uh, um, it might not be that destination. Let's change to go somewhere by the sea, for example. So we get to know where are we heading, and then we 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 measure that. So a final destination means an ideal lifestyle. Okay, like like if I imagine myself five ten years from now, this is my ideal life. I really don't want anything more than this. Okay, how many millions in my bank account? Let's say if it's not about money, where I want to live. Um, um, how I want to spend my day, my ideal uh, working day, my ideal weekend with whom, all of this is important to know, at least to measure, you know? And so having this together, having your passions, your values, ideal lifestyle, you want to be somewhere in the middle that satisfy your top passions, your core values, and help you to get closer even slowly yeah, in, 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 a, in a slower way to your final destination. Somehow that was my, my book, and this is why I'm doing. But I figured out that people needed another answer, um, which is before knowing the how, if they start busting some of the Smith that are locking them into their lives, I think they start going full speed in their career. So when you believe that oh, specialization is not for me anymore, and I believe being a career shapeshifter is, is a good thing for me, I'm convinced. When I believe that it's never too late, uh, when I believe that uh, change is not risky anymore, I should actually be friend with, with change. I should actually embrace and foresee change. And then I'm prepared for the future. Um, I will start acting in a different way. Uh, so diving deeper into all these myths, uh, help people to unlock themselves, you know, one by one. Um, and then I think the how comes. After that, so somehow I, I listened to the feedback from you know readers, people, clients, and I saw this could be a very first conversation that we can have talking about the myth and how they start you know unlocking themselves, and then when you start going full speed, I think okay, tell me the how. I really want to change right now. Thank you for the answer. Um... You you touched on something which I think is uh, perhaps one of the, I don't know whether you would refer to it as an excuse or a myth, but it's certainly something that people say, which is when they get fed up of their job, they're only going for the money at that point. And um, yeah. maybe they've progressed far enough, so they perceive that it's difficult enough for them to change. So uh, of all the things that you mentioned, which I absolutely, I, I love the the three areas that you covered in terms of what you should be doing to find your passion. To what degree does money come into that? Well, that when, when you also do the value exercise, I call it the value meter, I made it clearly that money is not in your values. Money is never one of your values. And, 
and it's important to have money as a tool to help you to achieve to, whether to satisfy your values or find passions or reach an ideal lifestyle or have an impact or whatever. Um, but let's have money versus financial stability or financial freedom. I would argue that financial stability is a value because it's, it's about having enough money help me to live a stable life. Or on the other side, because I believe that stability is the other side of the coin of freedom. If you, you, need, you, you have to get one, whether this or this. If I go for freedom, which I love, I see financial freedom is a goal in itself or a value in itself that will help me to live the life of my dreams. But still money is not the... Because if money is an, an ultimate value, I can do anything to get money, right? I can, I can you know, send drugs to get money. I can do anything. But then again, having your values and your moralities and all of this, and then knowing your real goal, let's say, if it's financial freedom, there are many, many ways to get financial freedom while not endangering your values, uh, other values, I would say. So what about those people who uh, they feel as though they're obligated by, for example, uh, family responsibilities and yeah. mortgages yeah. and stuff? What what would you say to them? Yeah. Well, I, I spoke about this also in time to move on. Uh, and I call it, I have bills to pay myth. So it, a lot of people say, oh, I have bills to pay. I cannot do it. Sorry. Maybe you, because of your situation, you can do it. But maybe, for me, no. And uh, while I argue, Yes, it's important to pay your bills and you know take care of your responsibilities and all of that. But I also would argue that we are not here in this life to pay our bills and then die. You know, I'm 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 not here just to pay all these bills on a monthly basis and uh, somehow at some point, uh, well, I'm I'm happy because I I mostly paid my bills and now I can die. We're here for something bigger than this. Okay, so. Try to figure out what's what is more important than this while taking care of your bills. It's important to take care of your bills. So um, also having the plan is is crucial. So uh, because it's not easy to leave a job, it's not easy to start, you know, buying businesses or or achieving financial freedom or creating different assets that help you to achieve the dream. But I'm also in that situation where, okay. These are my bills. I'm taking care of them. I learn a lot about financial education. And then at the same time, I'm trying to reach my goal step by step. But if I just keep that goal close to my heart and it's like my, my life purpose, I think, I think it's silly. It's, it's a waste of life to live, to pay your bills, and then just die. I think it's a waste of life. But it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's something I have to do. I have to take care of while trying to reach my my life purpose if i would say thank you for that um we, you. i i asked you about um the the book um and you know uh what it was like why did you write it um who is it for who should buy the book well originally my focus is mid-level careers and i would i would argue there's different def definitions of mid-level career but it can go from 25 to 45 years old uh, people who have a bit of experience in one career and they have their specialization and somehow they think, oh, I, I think I'm enough. I really want to change uh, what I'm, I'm here. Um, having said that, there is a chapter that is never too late. So and that's directed to about 50. So I tell stories of people in their late 50s, late 60s, about how they changed their life too. Uh, so I would say it's, I don't like this answer, but it applies to everybody. But I like to start with mid-level career because you have a bit of experience in your life. You have a bit of experience um, and you, you get to know what you really know and what you don't know in life. So, okay, it's time for change. And also you have the motivation to change your life. Uh, I, I saw it a bit harder when you are beyond 50, 60. I see a lot of people are, it's really hard for them to leave because it's somehow it's hard to change. They have responsibilities. It's still feasible. And also, when you're younger than this, my advice to 
younger generation. You know, if you don't have a job, go out and get a job. Just learn, get some experience in life, and then figure out what you really want to know, what you don't want to do, and then come back and let's you know, work with them. I I'm, I wouldn't argue 23 years old or 22 years old. Uh, you know, you need to build some experience in life, and then after some time, it's fine to change. You know, it's okay. A teenager that need to stick to a specialization, I would argue, it's better to late specialize than early specialize. So pick something, try it, enjoy it or not, and then move to the next. Well, I asked you about um, the main misconception that I have heard in my life. Um, have I missed any? Are there any major ones that you want to highlight in terms of people who say that they can't do it when, when they can? Well, yeah, most, yeah, you recover everything, everything, and all the questions were very, very interesting. Um, it was, this was a trend I could see in people when they could start dreaming, when they know, when they start going through this process, I could see the trend is going definitely toward financial freedom. When they start just allowing themselves to dream out of their life and figure out their passions, you know, their values, and building and, and visualizing an ideal lifestyle, I see that it's mostly going toward financial freedom. And uh, I see more and more trends going to that direction. So somehow I feel that people are going back to their origin. And um, let's say until 200 years ago, uh, most of the people were business owners, whether they were farmers or, you know, have a small shop or whatever, or, you know, trading, mostly were business owners. Uh, somehow we had to, we were forced to specialize for economic purposes and several others to stick to a job, count on somebody that will pay your paycheck, by right? Paycheck by the end of the month. And that's it. But now, seeing some economic trends like the Great Resignation, quite quitting, and a lot of others, where millions of people are leaving their jobs willingly, I see why this is happening. There are many reasons, but one of them is we are trying to go back to our origin, which is doing different things in life, because human nature is, is different from, I would say, ants or bees. Ants or bees are specialists. You know, it does the same type of job every single day until the last day in her life. Or so, but us, we created a shapeshifter to do different things. And what is, I don't know, what, what defines a shapeshifter than an entrepreneur? Somebody who owns different businesses, somebody who does different things in life. Uh, it, it definitely satisfies the, you know, that human nature, if I would say. So somehow I see we're going back to our nature. Yeah, I guess I would say. Thank you for that. Um, you've mentioned Thank a couple you. of times about the ideal life, what your ideal life would be. And I think having a vision for your ideal is a, is a great thing to do. But we touched yeah. on perhaps what part of your ideal life would be, um, you personally, uh, before we started the, um, the recording, which was about travel. And this is more yes. of a, I'm, I'm interested to know what your thoughts on on this are, because we're, we're almost polar opposites. So I have been in the same place for many, many years. If someone asks me if I want to go on holiday, I'll typically say I don't really want to go. So what is great about travel and why should I do it? Yeah, I mean, if, if travel was a value early in my life and also a passion, if I would say, I think it was a, a big motivation for me to change my career from a pharmacist to a diplomat. Um, Somehow, I grew up with my parents. They used to travel a lot. So I grew up when I was, even since I was one year old, I grew up traveling uh, different places, different countries. We used to live in different countries for three years each. Uh, so I have that perspective of things that it's, it, it goes beyond uh, one single country or one single culture. And it's very interesting to get in touch with other cultures, other countries, languages, a lot of other things. Um, so when I moved to diplomacy, I thought, okay, I'm in my pharmacy right now. It's fine, but that pharmacy will be my golden cage. I will never leave it until the last day in my life. So I have to escape that cage very completely. Uh, the answer was in diplomacy. I, I linked diplomacy to big values like 
I want to represent my culture in the best possible way. I want to represent my country in the best possible way. And I use that to satisfy that big value and, and that purpose in my life. But then I also kept traveling because uh, I went to work in Africa and Malawi. I went to work in the United Nations in New York. I work in China. I went for short missions everywhere. And somehow, you know, the, the ceiling, and you are losing the bet to yourself, and the ceiling is ex expanding to you. So I want to do more. Uh, and then somehow the answer came when I moved to investment banking, because I used to work in a place um, it's called AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's like the World Bank. And uh, it was a startup bank at that time, 2016. So we were covering the whole map. So we were based in China, but I used to travel to name it, you know, anywhere in Asia, Middle East, all the way to Latin America, Europe. So um, at least once per month, you have a mission somewhere. So, and that also expanded my, this is the life I want to live. I want to keep traveling, uh, you know, all the time. And uh, it's also interesting because if, if I, I have to plan, you know, a mission to Latin America, and I don't know enough about Latin America, uh, except maybe I speak Spanish. Okay, how would you, how would I learn enough about the infrastructure space in Peru and Chile and Argentina in two, three days and go out there for a mission that, you know, only lasts for 10 days and come back with bankable project, if I would call them, or like feasible project. Um, so I learned a lot in that. Somehow when I moved to uh, this life, um, I could see the value of doing my work from wherever I am. Uh, so when I was writing this book, I just, I, I, I went to Zanzibar and Zanzibar is somewhere in, in the Indian Ocean by the beach, by the sea. Uh, it's an island uh, in Tanzania. And I started writing this book. So I, I wrote, I think, four chapters in a couple of days. Uh, I talked to one of my mentors in storytelling, uh, Geoffrey, uh, uh, Berlin, and he told me, it seems that you write quick when and efficiently when you are by the beach. So find another journey and go. So I went to the Maldives and I finished the whole book there. So somehow you get to know more about yourself. And then when you start expanding your ceiling of, I want to keep traveling all the time. If I stay in now, right now, if I stay in the same place for more than two months, um, oh, I'm, I'm hopeless. So I really have to <laughs> start traveling again. Um, so somehow, it's, it's true it, that travel broadens the mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And you get to learn a lot. You get to expand, you know, your horizon. I always tell people who work in the same country or culture for a long time, have at least one year experience somewhere else. You know, no matter if you think it will be uh, a tough experience, if you think it will be, you know, horrible for you, go out and learn because you're going to expand your horizon. You're going to learn a lot about another culture, how things are done there. Definitely going to learn a lot. It's a great answer. Um, thank you. Is there anything that I should have asked you about today? Uh, thanks, Thomas. I think you're... you're... <laughs> You ask about everything. If if one thing I would I would like to talk about, I like also to talk about this a lot. It's also about giving and 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 the importance of having a charitable cause for each one of us in in life. And if you ask me if there is a dream and somewhere in my dream lifestyle, ideal lifestyle, I would love to do more for orphans. Uh, in, especially in terms of education. And back when I was 15 years old, for some religious reasons, um, I was giving more to, you know, that cause, you know, orphans. So I was giving from my pocket money. Somehow, the more I gave, the more life gave me back. The more I gave, the more life gave me back. And then uh, um, when I moved to coaching and entrepreneurship, I started dreaming big about this. So my dream, hopefully by 2030, is to help 1 million orphans between the age of 12 to 18 to dream about their life. And the idea here is, you know, it's somehow tough for them to, to dream about their life. You know, they don't have parents around them, you know, or community to help them to dream. You're, you don't expect much from them. Go get a job and that's it. I would love to help as many orphan kids to dream about their lives. 
and then help them to build those two those dreams. For example, if if the dream is to create a startup or create a business, I will build a startup incubator for them. So my dream is uh, by 2030, one million orphans uh, uh, to dream about their life, and that's why in in time to move on, every copy sold, there's one dollar will be given to that cause. Well, congratulations. It's great to hear and um, 100% on board. I, I think I read in um, there's a, a book called uh, The Life You Can Save is something along the, the lines of um, I think it's about $2,000. You can literally save someone's life by uh, in, in that amount. So someone is alive today if you if you're able to con contribute that amount. So um, and I think people do tend to spend I don't know more than that on on things which perhaps aren't as as valuable as a human life. So I agree. Exactly. So uh, if people want to buy the book or connect with you, where do they go? Uh, thanks, Thomas. So it's uh, available on Amazon. Time to move on. It's uh, on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Also, uh, an indie store close to your home. You can definitely uh, ask them to order it for you. So hopefully, it's everywhere cl closer to you and uh, wherever you are. Mustafa, thanks for being a great guest today. Thank you so much, Thomas. I really appreciate being a great uh, host. Thank you. <laughs>